It is July 6, 2016. I am laying next to my wife in bed, and we are watching something on Netflix, and we're chilling, but we're not chilling. But she does look beautiful and radiant as she is carrying our son who was due to exit her womb the very next day, though he would decide to come a couple of days later. It also happens to be my 33rd birthday. I'm in that unique position of recognizing that I am fortunate to experience another year of life. I'm experiencing the beauty that is the expansions of one's lungs as I inhale and exhale, knowing that my baby boy is doing the exact same thing in my wife's stomach. I am eating my favorite pizza. We are watching one of our favorite shows, and it's one of those moments where it feels like nothing can go wrong. But on that day, something does go wrong. Something happens to someone that I don't know in a place I've never been in Falcon Heights, Minnesota. Philando Castile finds himself in a car with his girlfriend and her four-year-old daughter when they are stopped by police. Castile informs the officer that he has a registered gun. The officer, in mere seconds, shoots Castile, his girlfriend. Diamond Reynolds has the presence of mind to video record his now blood-soaked body that will soon go lifeless in another mere matter of seconds or moments. Her daughter is going to plead with her for her to be mindful of what is going to be said to the police because she doesn't want for her to suffer the same fate. And even though I have seen the video several times, I can't imagine the horror of experiencing it in real time, of being a little girl wondering if your mother is next and will it happen in front of you of being a girlfriend who had a significant other who was a part of the realm of livelihood that all of a sudden finds himself in the abyss of death. Castile was 32 years old on that day. He would never have an opportunity to experience a 33rd birthday. He would never know what it's like to lay next to his wife as she's about to give birth to a child that belongs to them while he's eating his favorite pizza, watching something that is one of his favorite shows on Netflix. He will never get that reality because all of that was snatched on July 6, 2016, and it serves as a really cold reminder that being black can get you killed. Not just by those at the hands of those who are supposed to protect and serve, we're reminded of this atrocity by the heart disease and the cancers that seem to claim us sooner, by the disparity in infant mortality, by the bullets that seem to claim our young men and young women in our communities with an authority that suggests that the shell casings had their name on it. And now I find myself the father of a beautiful one-year-old black boy who I have hopes and dreams for, whose intelligence leaves me astounded, whose smile is so radiant that even the sun must capitulate to its brightness, who, when he says the word daddy, I promise you, it feels like an angel is serenading my heart. My son is adorable. And there are so many others who believe the same thing, but some of them I know years from now are going to see my son as a threat. They're going to forget how cute he was. That is in spite of us being 153 years removed from slavery, in spite the fact that we are one year short of the 400th anniversary of when the first African slaves were taken to the shores of Virginia, a colony named after a British joint stock company. And we find ourselves here because in America, we've never truly invested in genuine and authentic equality. It took bloodshed for slavery to end. It took bloodshed for Jim Crow and segregation to end. And if one's humanity can only be brought to light by one's death, then it really suggests that humanity can never be properly valued, properly assessed, properly cherished. So we find ourselves in a very interesting predicament. We realize that we are in an era where we are living in post-segregated America in name only. 
but not in actuality. Our schools and our neighborhoods bear this fact out. The fact is that when we often see a host of events, there seems to be a polar opposite perspective between the races. Whether it be a football player kneeling during the national anthem or an unarmed black person being killed at the hands of police, it seems as though, though we are living in a country that is geographically connected and united, it often feels that we are not living in a united nation, that we are living in an area of two Americas, a white one and a black one, that's in spite slavery being over because slavery did not eliminate the real cancer. Jim Crow did not eliminate the real cancer. And this is the reason why we live in a segregated America, but we accept it. We may complain momentarily, but we accept it, we see it, we read about it, and we move on, and it becomes normalized because we never really got rid of the real cancer, which is that there are people that believe that black people are inherently inferior to whites. It is something that occupies the minds of both whites and blacks as well. And we as a nation continue to live this lie and we can never be free until we live in truth. So for whites who deny the powerful role that history and policy has had on our racial dynamics, they are living in a lie. And for blacks who have had a history of slavery and Jim Crow be 300 years longer than a history without it, who find themselves currently in an era of mass incarceration and gentrification, it is hard to not believe in the lie as well. So here we are in separate sections, but yet when it comes to being in a mental prison, being in the same place and what makes all of this so disturbing is that race is completely a social construct. It is something that was created to benefit a particular group of people over another group of people. It was created for economic gain. What we find is that race is a pseudoscience. It's hogwash. It really should not be real at all. And yet, though that is the case, its consequences are not only real, but deadly, impacting the lives of millions upon millions of people where bodies find themselves having their blood stream in the street or individuals find themselves incarcerated or young children find themselves not believing in their educational endeavors because of a pseudoscience. So how do we solve it? I'm not going to suggest to you that I have all of the answers, but I, I have a good sense of where maybe we should start. It's in two children's books that I've often have read to my son. The first one is The Rainbow Fish. It's a story about a fish with rainbow colored scales who is one day approached by a fish who requests if he could have one of his scales. The rainbow fish bristles at the request and the fish that made the request goes away saddened and the other fish around the sea see what just occurred and they too decide to distance themselves from the rainbow fish. One day, the rainbow fish, feeling lonely, decides to go to his lone friend, the starfish, to seek some advice and the starfish instructs him to go seek the octopus because the octopus was full of wisdom and it is there that the octopus tells him, maybe you do want to just give one of your scales. So when the opportunity again presented itself to give away one of his scales, this time, though reluctantly, the rainbow fish gives away his scale. The fish that was that now new recipient of a new rainbow colored scale is filled with gratitude and embraces the rainbow fish. And now the rainbow fish finds himself having a new spirit of generosity and he gives all of his scales except for one so that all of the fish can have at least one rainbow scale. At that moment, the rainbow fish experienced liberation. When the rainbow fish realized that his identity was not tied into the color of his scales, but rather his ability to connect with the community of the other fish, 
he became liberated and free. When he realized that it is better to give than to withhold, that there is something powerful about having a connection and being one with others, the rainbow fish was liberated. And so here we have white supremacists continuously being in a mental prison. And they will never be liberated until they realize that their main identity is in their humanity and not their whiteness. They will always be in prison because they will always be upset. Because there will always be a new immigrant coming to America. There will always be an interracial couple that seems to pop out of nowhere. There will always be a black person who has a position of a higher standard and they will continue to seek their tiki torches find somewhere online to air their grievances and they will never be happy in order for America to really become what it should be. We need more white Americans to get in the game and destroying the myth that blacks are naturally inferior to really learn about our history, to really stop with the narrative of who past the past, but understand that when something has been a part of a nation for so long, it has no choice but to go deep within the marrows of the bones of that society. What we need are for more rainbow fishes to come to the conclusion that it is better to give. The other book is The Carrot Seed. It's a story about a boy who plants a carrot seed and with joy, he goes and tells his mother about what he had just done. His mother cautions him and says, well, son, the carrot seed may not grow. He tells his father about what he had just done, and his father was even more pessimistic and said, son, the carrot seed probably will not grow. When he goes to his older brother, his older brother laughs at him and says, the carrot seed will not grow. The boy, undeterred continued to do everything that was necessary in order for that carrot seed to grow until one day he finds himself in the yard and realizes that his faith has been rewarded and that the carrot is now protruding out of the ground. For those of us who are part of a community categorized as the black community, we must continue to plant seeds. We must believe that we have the power to cause a revolution in our educational system. We must believe that we have the power to create an economic engine to bring us to a moment in time like Black Wall Street. We must believe that we can be the politicians we've always been looking for. We must believe that we can build the infrastructures that we've been so desperate for. We must believe and we must continue to plant seeds even in the midst of the dry season, in the midst of the most heinous drought, in the midst of the myriad of doubting faces, we must continue to plant seeds. In other words, we must continue to do what we've always done, but just do it even better. But we should not do this alone. All of us in this room and in this nation must get our hands dirty. We must find ourselves placing our hands and plowing the soil and plant more seeds, we must do so even when it feels like the water is not properly saturating the soil. We must work until our t-shirts have nothing but dirt stains on it so we can finally be where we need to be as a nation. We must start really asking ourselves, how many? How many more lives have to die due to the pseudoscience? How many more people have to find themselves in a prison cell simply because of how their skin has been painted? How many children who have all kinds of capacities and capabilities have to have a substandard education because of lack of belief? How many? How many times do we have to see in the news about there being a disconnect, about someone losing their lives about a girlfriend watching her boyfriend being killed in front of her, about a daughter wondering whether or not her mother is next. How many times do we have to live this way? The answer depends on how many of us would choose to become planters.